Well, let's cover a couple more of them. First one is this, covetousness. Oh yeah, covetousness. You know, that's selfishness. I remember talking to a young lady once about this idea of covetousness, and no joke, she looked at me and she said, what's wrong with wanting something that somebody else has? She really thought there was nothing wrong with it. I said, well, you know, it's one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not covet. Okay? Um, Hebrews 13, 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. Oh, are we very thankful people? No, we are covetous people. We're not content. We're not satisfied with what we have. We always want more. You get something, you want something more. If you go out and buy a new car, oh man, you enjoy that new car, and the next year, the new model comes out, and you're like, man, why did I buy that? Why didn't I wait a year? Why? Well, guess because we're not content. We're covetous. It's all about me. I want more. I want more. Do we ever see little kids get that way? And little kids who get that way, and they grow up, you know what they do when they get older? I want more. I want more. They just go, you know, it's maybe not as high pitched. They just go, I want more. I want more. They're still selfish. So that's one symptom, covetousness. How about another one? Ingratitude. Selfish people are not very thankful people. We come around Thanksgiving, and this is a time we're supposed to be thankful. What about the rest of the year? Okay? But ingratitude is a sign of selfishness, and if you have to, all of a sudden, you say, oh, now it's time to, I, I got to be thankful. I got to make my list. I got to make it happen now because it's Thanksgiving. Uh, you're missing something. Okay. Do you find yourself complaining more than you do thanking? I mean, life is filled with problems, isn't it? And then you're always complaining about people. You're always complaining about such, why did this have to happen? Why is it? I'm so tired of that person and this person and everything. And we start murmuring and complaining. And Philippians 2.14 still says, do all things without murmuring and disputings. All things. All things. Have people ever irritate you? You know, and it seems like sometimes, like every other sentence is every time you talk about someone, oh, that stupid jerk, that stupid jerk. You know, the whole world, you know, are not stupid jerks. And even if they are, you know, be thankful for stupid jerks. <laughs> because you know what? Sometimes we're stupid jerks too. All right? And be thankful God hasn't, you know, just done that to us like you want to do to someone else who's a stupid jerk rather than complaining about what you don't have talking about this idea of covetousness again why don't you thank God for what you do have in second first Thessalonians 5 18 in everything give thanks in everything give thanks not always easy to put into practice, is it? Man, it, when, when I drove into the dump truck at about 65, 70 miles an hour, and my wife broke her neck, and I smashed my head and crushed my chest, and we're laying in, you know, I, I couldn't roll on my side for weeks. I couldn't sleep on my side. Oh, and by the way, a couple days after the accident, I couldn't cough, I couldn't laugh, anything was in extreme pain, and then my very good friend, Pastor Dameron, calls up and starts cracking jokes. <laughs> I'm laughing. Hey, you stupid jerk. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't say that. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you. It was very, you know, I tried to practice what we preach, and I, I started making a list. And saying, Lord, thank you that this happened this way. And there, I went through and I made a list of things. There were unbelievable miracles that transpired during that accident. My kids were in the back seat. I just told you what happened to my wife and I. And she broke her wrist in four places. My kids were in the back seat with no seat belts. 
car didn't have seat belts. It was an 89 Honda Civic. And they walked away. No problem. I mean, every, I could just, I could stand here and tell you for the next several minutes, which I don't have time, but I could just go on and on and on about what happened and how God intervened. And it got me to focus on God instead of on, woe is me. God has a plan in everything. And we need to be thankful, but ingratitude is a sign, it's a symptom of selfishness. And at the heart of ingratitude, like I said, is selfishness, right? The children of Israel, they, come, they spake against God in the wilderness. They spake against Moses. And God sent those fiery serpents in there. Why? Because they murmured and complained. So covetousness, ingratitude. How about another one? Anger. Anger. Jonah went. He, he was called to go and preach to Nineveh. He didn't want to go to preach to Nineveh. So God made a big, a big storm. He made a big fish. He sent Jonah down into the, into the belly of the whale. He was there for three days, three nights. He didn't like that very much. He got some things straightened out, started talking to the Lord and praying. And then the, the, the fish spit him back up on shore. He went running and he got to Nineveh. He preached. He still wasn't happy. He got done. And then by chapter four, after he got done doing all that God told him to do, he still wasn't happy. And Jonah chapter four, verse one, it says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was very angry. You know, when things don't go well or don't go your way or don't go the way you want it to go, when it displeases you, one of the, 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 the reactions is anger, right? Someone crosses you. Ah! <laughs> I'm going to kill them. I'm going to cut them off. I'm going to tear them apart. I'm going to rip them to pieces. I'm going to defame them. I'm going to make everybody against them. Why do you get angry? Because you don't get your way. Because someone crossed you. You, you, you. It all revolves around you and me and me and me. Anger. Got a problem with anger? You got a problem with selfishness. That's what, it's all about you, right? How about another symptom? How about being unapproachable? There are some people, you know, if you go and try to talk to them about anything, they're just going to explode. You can't talk to them about anything. And you, know, you ever talk to somebody and then they, or, and then they just, they start talking louder and then you start talking louder and then they start talking louder and then you start talking louder and pretty soon there's just two people that are shouting at each other. I know you've never seen or heard that, right? Oh, no, 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 no. No, the cry of self is this. Don't tell me what to do. That's selfishness. Don't correct me. Don't tell me when I'm wrong. Don't criticize me. Don't push me to do my best. Young people, your parents are concerned. They want you to do your best. They know you could do more. They push you a little bit. Don't push me. You don't say it, but you act it. Don't deprive me of what I want. I deserve that thing. No, what we deserve is God's judgment. Don't put restrictions on me. All these are the cry of self. I have my rights. I have my rights. Leave me alone. How about another cry? Shut up. It's all, I don't want to hear you. I want to hear me. And I want you to hear me, so shut up. Oh, and here's the new one. This is a new movement I'm going to start. My life matters. Oh, yeah, it's right there. My life matters. Now, let me ask you, are you unapproachable? If, if people can't approach you, you got a problem with you. Your problem's not with everybody else. It's with you. And you need to take care of you. I need to take care of me. And when I take care of me, then me isn't as bad as it was. How about another one? Being overly sensitive. Everybody's always picking on me. Leave me alone. How dare you? I like this one. Don't you know who I am? Yeah, I've heard someone say that before. It's like, what do you mean I can't do this? Don't you know who I am? 
Yeah, that's why you can't do it. <laughs> and of the old classic one, well, who do you think you are? Well, overly sensitive. That's another symptom. How about stubbornness? I don't want to. Or the kids, do I have to? Uh, that's not a good thing to allow in your home. Do I have to? No, yes, you do, and I, let me explain to you why you have to. <laughs> and let me remind you why you're not going to say, do I have to again? Do I have to? Stubbornness, that comes from stubbornness. Stubbornness is selfishness. Don't move me, don't push me. I want to do what I want to do, and don't tell me anything otherwise. How about this one? In uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 45, uh, another symptom is wanting to be served rather than wanting to serve. In Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto. Jesus didn't come to be served. Now, of all people, he should be served. He's the King of Kings. But he didn't come to be served. He says, but to minister. That means to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. See, life is not about everyone doing something for you. Some people get that way, don't they? We start feeling sorry for ourselves. We go through a hard time, and pretty soon, maybe some people show us a little bit of attention. So now we want everybody's attention all the time. You drop everything what you're doing, and all rally around me and, and take care of me and me and me and me and me. You're going to be a miserable me. Because you're not good. You're not going to be happy just taking in. You've heard of the Dead Sea, right? Why is it called the Dead Sea? You know, it, it receives so much. It receives, you know, you know, millions of gallons of, of fresh water down the Jordan River. And it gets down in the Red Sea. It doesn't give anything out to anybody else. It doesn't, it doesn't have any rivers flowing from it. It just gets there and everything's dead. There's no fish that live there. It's the Dead Sea. And it's a picture of a lot, of, a lot of people. They just take and take and take and take. They don't give anything back. Wow, you feel dead, don't you? It's miserable existence. God doesn't want us to live that way. And the last symptom is this. Putting your will ahead of God's will. Back in our text we had read there in verse number 59, but he said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Down in verse 61, and another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell. It was all about them. I'll follow you, but let me do what I want to do first. Let me say, there are some of you that you know what you're doing right now is wrong. You know it's wrong, and you've justified it. You say, well, I'm going to do it. I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway because that's what I want to do. And later, I'll do what's right. You got it all planned out. I'm telling you, it doesn't work that way. You know, we, we seem to be willing to follow God when he's going our direction. But when he's going a direction we don't want to go, then we don't want to follow him because we're selfish. I heard a story about a little boy. He was pulling a wagon. Oh, man, he was all happy. He's got this little girl in the back of the wagon. He's pulling this wagon. He's all smiles. And he sees his aunt, and he says, hey, I want her to be happy. However, the girl wasn't happy. She wasn't really happy at all. In fact, she's trying to get out of the wagon. And, and um, the aunt says, she doesn't like that, Bobby. And he replied, but I want her to be happy doing what I like. Yeah. And we're off in the same way. We want God to accept our will, and we want him to be happy with what makes us happy. You go to prayer not to see what God wants you to do, but you want God to put his stamp of approval on what you want to do. That's selfishness. And when we put our will ahead of God's will, hey, that is a sure sign we're heading down the wrong road. 
You say, well, okay, so what? I, maybe I'm a little bit selfish. Okay, well, let's move secondly to the complications. With any disease, if you don't treat it, things just get better, right? No, it gets worse. In fact, selfishness can spread through a soul just like cancer does through a body. So let's look at some of the complications. First one is this, is injury, injury. You know, in 1 Peter chapter 2, 11, uh, if you follow a little Bible reading schedule that some of you do, you read this verse this morning. It says, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against what? The soul. And while trying to please self, we go to these fleshly lusts. They war against what? The soul. So you try to please yourself, and in, in essence, you're really hurting yourself. You're just causing further injury. That's a complication. You say, I'm going to be happy. You're not going to be happy. I want to do this. Go ahead and do it. You won't be happy in the end. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. How about another one? Turn with me back to Joshua chapter number 7. Joshua chapter number 7. Another complication. Okay, we've seen the symptoms. Well, what about the complications? Joshua chapter number 7, verse 21. Some of you know about the story of Achan. God had told him to, to go in, and everything from this first victory was going to be God's. They weren't supposed to take anything. And in, in, in the subsequent battles that they had, they were going to be able to take the spoil and divide it up and have all sorts of good stuff. But this first thing, everything was supposed to be God's. But there was one guy named Achan, all right? He didn't want to follow God. He saw some stuff. He says, I like this stuff. I don't care what God says. I want this. So what happened? We see this in verse chapter 7, verse 21. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them. See, I, I, and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. This guy saw stuff that he wanted and he got selfish, he got covetous, he took the stuff he wasn't supposed to take, all out of selfishness. It's all about me. He didn't learn about GoFundMe, I guess. But down there in verse number 25, and Joshua said, why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall what? Trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire. And they, uh, after they had stoned them with stones, I guess that's trouble, isn't it? In fact, down there in uh, the, the end of the verse that says, uh, wherefore the name of that place was called Valley of Achor unto this day. The word Achor means trouble. He even got a valley named after him. The Valley of Trouble. Trouble. That's the second uh, complication. You get selfish, it always leads to trouble. You want a life filled with trouble? How many like trouble? Anybody like trouble? I don't like trouble. I don't want any more trouble than I've got. I got enough trouble. And if I get selfish, I'm going to have more trouble. Probably a good idea not to stay selfish. All right, so injury, trouble, rejection. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 says, Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud but giveth grace to the humble. Selfishness is pride. And when selfish people pray, God resists them. He rejects their prayers. You're going to have needs. You're going to have problems. You're going to need the Lord. And when you're living a life of selfishness and you go to prayer, you want to do it your way. You don't want to follow God's will. What are you going to do when tragedy hits, trials come, and you need God, and you need an answer to prayer right now? And he says, no, just, just stay away. So he wouldn't do that. The Bible says he does that. He resisteth the proud. See, God is a God of grace, but he reserves it for humble people. Humble people are not selfish people. And we lose so many of God's blessings because of selfishness. Now, Turn with me to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23. Another 
complication is a basement, not that thing in your house. It means being brought low. God will bring you low. He will abase you. In Matthew 23, verse 12, it says, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be what? Abased. And he that shall humbleth himself, humble himself shall be exalted. You will be brought low. Oh, so many people flying high, pushing self, pushing self, pushing self, and it all comes crashing in one day. Right? It all comes crashing in. Next, loneliness. It's another complication. Loneliness. How many people like to be around selfish people? You like it at the checkout counter, right? Being around those kids, reaching out of the cart, trying to pull, pull something off the you know, candy bar or something off the thing, and mom's saying no, and yeah, I want this. And, that, and they're screaming, they're throwing a fit. They're all being selfish, and then it's just, it's a total meltdown, and you just, you just want to be out of there. Amen? Whew. And my wife and I flew to Salt Lake City, and we were at the airport, and we go through the security, and some little girl, I mean, we just hear the screaming, blood-curdling screams, I mean, uh, way down another section of the of security. And then we figured out that it was a little girl who didn't want to have to get out of her stroller and the stroller to go through the, through the extra. And she was just throwing a fit. I mean, it was just embarrassed. I was embarrassed for her. It was so bad. I mean, there are hundreds, hundreds, probably thousands of people just like, huh? And I said, whoa, that is horrible. And, you know, it's a big airport. You know, there's all sorts of flights going out. I am not kidding you. That child was sitting directly behind me, the seat right behind me on the whole th way out to Salt Lake City. Oh, it was a blessing. <laughs> so, oh, so maybe it's not so bad when your flight gets canceled sometimes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Loneliness. You know, no one wants to be, I didn't want to be around that little girl. I couldn't do a lot about it, but, you know, and no one wanted to be around you when you're just focused on yourself all the time. You know, when you, as, you, as you look at that little girl and say, she's just a baby. Well, she wasn't a baby. She was acting like one. That's how people look at us. And you wonder why you don't have friends? You wonder why don't people wanna, don't want to hang out with you? You wonder why they don't say, hey, come on over for some fellowship because they know it ain't going to be fellowship. It's all going to about, be about me. Next one is discouragement. Discouragement. At first, Job, when he had his crisis in him, I mean, he lost everything. And at first, man, he, he took that, that loss very well. In Job 1, verses 20 to 22, it says, Job fell down upon the ground and worshiped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And what a wonderful testimony, how he just looked to God during his trial. And all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. However, his friends came around, which weren't so very weren't very good friends, and then all of a sudden he started feeling sorry for himself. He ended up getting discouraged. And by the time you get to chapter 7 of Job, verse 7, it says, Oh, remember that my life is wind. The wind just kind of comes and goes. He says, Mine eye shall no more see good. He had lost hope. He got all discouraged. My eye, will, I'll never see any more good anymore. I've had all these problems, and I'll, it'll never turn. That's what happens when you get inward. You start looking at all your problems, and it just gets worse and worse, and you start thinking, things are so bad, they'll never get better. And that's why people blow their brains out. They hang themselves. They OD. Because of selfishness. Selfishness. Discouragement stems from selfishness. Are you discouraged today? Don't feel sorry for yourself. Go to God. Do what Job did in the first place. He looked to God and God helped him. And the last complication is death. Death. You know, you get so focused on self. You know, you're going to kill relationships. You're going to kill your finances. You're going to kill your marriage. You're going you're to kill all sorts of stuff. Uh, a story about a man named Sundar Singh. He was traveling with a, a Tibetan man 
on a, a cold, snowy day. And they both felt it was so cold. And they, they were just shutting down, probably starting to suffer from hypothermia. And felt very, too cold to even go on. They were just feeling frozen. And um, they noticed as they traveled that they saw a man who had slipped off a cliff and uh, slipped off over an edge and was laying on the rocks below a cliff. And the man was alive, but he was, he was dying. He was on the cold. They must have come shortly after he had fallen. And then and, and seeing, he wanted to, to go down and help him. But the other guy said, hey, you know, if we do that, we can't even barely make it ourselves. We don't have enough energy for ourselves. If we go down there, we're toast. He said, so forget that. I'm going on. And Singh said, no, you go on, but I'm going to go down there. I'm going to get this man. So he climbed down. He pulled this man up. And then he got back on the path. And he, he put the man, he carried him on his back. And as they went on their way for a while, Singh came across that man who had went ahead and he was lying dead on the path. He didn't want to stop and help. He wanted to take care of himself. He was selfish. Well, meanwhile, because he was carrying this guy, his body started getting heated up. He was getting revived. And the man who was dying actually, because of the warmth of this man's body, started reviving too. And they both made it to a village safe and sound. And when, that, when Singh got there, he remembered Christ's words, says this in, in Matthew 10, 39. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And that's what that first man was doing. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Living for self always ends in destruction, not blessing. You want to lose your life? Just live for self. Those are the complications. Quickly, the treatment. Okay, we've seen the symptoms. Some of us are guilty. Not just guilty, infected. <laughs> We've got to do something about this. We see the, the complications if we do nothing. Now let's consider the treatment. Now, most of these treatments, by the way, sometimes you take a, uh, a treatment that will cure you, and other times you take a little something that's called a prophylactic. If you do take a little bit of that medicine, it actually prevents you from getting a disease. Okay? There are, there are some people, when they go to different countries, they'll take a prophylactic for malaria. They don't want to catch malaria, so they take a little bit of this medicine, a reduced dosage, so they have a little bit of the medicine in them. So if they contact and come in any contact with this disease, then it'll, all, it'll, it'll be kind of... Um, killed already and they won't really come down with it full force because they got this prophylactic. They've been taking something to prevent them from really getting diseased. And if, they, if you really do get diseased and you take the medicine, then you can get over it too. Get the idea? And so sometimes we take medicine to cure us. Sometimes we take some medicine to prevent something from happening. I know some people don't like the flu shot and we're not going to debate that. But if the reason people get the flu shot is so that they don't come down with the flu later, okay? That's the reason. It's, like, it's kind of like a prophylactic, trying to take something to prevent it. Now, whether you need a cure or you just need to prevent selfishness from keep coming back, you've got to follow these things here that we'll have for you here at the end. The first one is this, acknowledge your selfishness. Acknowledge that you are inherently selfish. Look at the problem, Okay. I won't take the time to, to, do, to, to go back there and read it. Uh, I'll read it to you, but don't turn back there in, in Luke chapter 5. Peter had been fishing all night. He had caught nothing. He came back, and Jesus said, Hey, I want you to go back out there, and I want you to let down the nets. And Peter's thinking, Man, I'm, a, I'm an expert fisherman. I know what I'm doing. I, I fished all night. I didn't catch anything. I ain't letting down all those nets. I'll put down a net. So he threw out a net. He half obeyed like we do sometimes, because we're selfish. And that net filled up with so many fish, that net, that, fish started, that net started to break. And man, I'm telling you, he realized, oh, I'm, I'm wrong. He had been filled with his own ways, and the Lord confronted him with his sin. And what did he do? 
In Luke chapter 5, verse 8, I'll read it to you. When, Peter, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. What did he do? He saw it. He saw that he was filled with his own ways and that he wasn't following the Lord wholeheartedly and he confessed his sin. He said, I am a sinful man, O Lord. Really, he confessed it. Whether you're young or old, I know sometimes young people seem to even have a bigger problem with it. But whether you're young or old, if you don't confess it and look at it and say, I am wrong, I am selfish, I got a problem, I got to deal with this, you're going to keep on going down that road. Things aren't going to get better until you deal with you. You're looking at blaming at everybody else and finding problems with everybody else, but it's you, it's me. I am my problem. Adam said, huh, the woman thou gavest to be with me. He was blaming his wife. No, no, Adam, you, you ate the fruit. You didn't have to eat it. Oh, yeah. So acknowledge your sinfulness, your selfishness. Secondly, in Luke 22, let's move quickly here. In Luke 20, chapter 22, yield your will. Yield your will. Because it's all about me. No, yield your will. In Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 41, the Lord Jesus was going, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was soon to be crucified. The sin of the world was going to be put on him. He wanted to, to take away our sin, but he didn't want to become sin. He was God. He didn't want to become sin. He wanted to die for us. He wanted to help us. But you got to understand, because he's holy and God, he didn't want to be sin. So there's no contradiction in here when, when we read what we read. Look at here in verse 41. It says, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. That cup was the becoming sin. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You know, if there's something you don't want to do, why don't you at least be honest with God about it? Lord, if you could remove it, I'd be happy. But if you really want me to do it, let your will be done, not mine. Not mine. That's what God wants us to do. And once Jesus had prayed, not my will, but thine be done. Notice what happened in the next verse. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, what? Strengthening him. You see, when we yield our will and say, all right, Lord, I don't want to do this, but I know I need to do this. I'll do it. Let your will be done. Then God strengthens us to be able to do his will. But he won't strengthen you, and you won't be able to do, do that until you yield your will. Just yield. Stop saying, it's me, it's me, I want, I'm going my way. No, no, no. Yield your stubborn will. Then God can step in and strengthen you. Then, the third part of the treatment, so we acknowledge our selfishness, we yield our stubborn will, and then thirdly, oh, this sounds... A little contradictory, but we'll see what it means. Choose death. You just said we shouldn't try to kill ourselves. Oh, okay. Choose death. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. That's the death he's talking about. Death of self-will. Death of self-interest. Death of self-pursuit. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I but Christ liveth in me. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 31 said, I die daily. Now, how can you die daily and keep still being alive? Well, it wasn't physical death. We're not talking about physical death. We're talking about death to self. And then Paul was tempted. He was a great Christian. And we look at him and say, wow, the apostle Paul. I wish I was the apostle Paul. 
Well, if you want to be the Apostle Paul, just die daily. When he was tempted, and he was tempted, he said, I'm not going to do that. I want to do that, but I'm not going to do it. He died to self. That's the secret of the Christian life. Dying to self. John 12, 24 says, Verily, verily, Jesus was speaking, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. You take a little kernel of corn, you go drop it in the ground. That kernel of corn, if it's dead, it can live again. And when we die to self, that's when we begin to live. That's when God can start working through us. And when you're willing to let your self-interest be laid aside, God can begin to produce some wonderful things in your life. You know, and by the way, and when you're truly dead to self, you won't be easily offended. Because it's pretty hard to hurt a dead person, isn't it? And when we are so easily hurt, that's just a good sign that we're alive. And we're not supposed to be alive to self. A man was walking by a small shop one day, and the shop specialized in, in uh, dyes, you know, stains, you know, you dye things. And a sign was posted, it's kind of an interesting little sign that has a wonderful spiritual application. And you know, it's spelled dye, D-Y-E. It said, I live to die. I die to live. The more I die, the more I live. The more I live, the more I die. Apply that spiritually in consideration of Romans 6, 11. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Dead to sin, alive to God. And the last thing we should do, the last part of the treatment is just let Christ live. We read in Galatians 2, 20, nevertheless I live Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. It's not me living anymore, it's Christ. If I'm alive, my way, my, 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 me, 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 it's going to be a problem. But if he's alive and he's living through me, it's all going to work out good. See, when you get out of the way, God can begin to work. We just need to get tired of living that defeated, selfish, miserable life. You tired of it? Let Christ have the throne of your heart. It's time to step off the throne and allow the one who should be there to get on the throne and let him make the decisions and call the shots. Have you been frustrated? Have you frustrated the Lord by trying to do everything yourself? You know, you can serve God in your own energy. God doesn't want you to do that. He wants to do the work through you. You got a ministry and it's getting tiresome to you? It doesn't have to be you. It's got to be God doing it through you anyway. Get off the throne. Lord, here, you have control. I close with this. A little girl, she went to be a guest at another person's home, another family's home, and the bed that she was sleeping in, right above the bed was a big picture, a big painting of Jesus. And directly across the room was a dresser, and on the dresser there was a mirror. She went to sleep. She woke up the next morning, and as she woke up, she just lifted her head a little bit, and she saw in the mirror the reflection of Jesus. And that was, she was all excited that the first thing she saw when she woke up was Jesus. She knew it was the mirror, but she was all excited. She, she wanted a better look, and so she sat up, and as she sat up to, see a, to get a better look at Jesus, all she saw was herself, and she couldn't see Jesus anymore. So she laid back down. And as she lay back down, she got a good picture of Jesus again. She couldn't see herself. And she did this a few times. She'd sit back up, she'd see herself. She'd lay back down, she'd see Jesus. She'd sit up and see herself. She'd lay back down, she'd see Jesus. She told her mom about this, and she said, when I see myself, I don't see him. And when I see him, I don't see myself. And how true that is spiritually. My question for you this morning is, what are you seeing? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Nobody looking, please. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Do you have a case of this selfishness? Let's be honest. I didn't 
preach this to those who are unsaved. I preach this to those of us who are saved. Now listen, if you're not saved, come down. We're going to have a, an, what we call an invitation. The music's going to begin to play in just a moment. Come down. Say, I'm not sure if I'm going to heaven when I die. Come down when the music begins to play. See one of these men at the front, and they'll have someone take the Bible and show you how you can have forgiveness of sins. You see, you can't save yourself. That's selfishness. Come to Jesus. You need Jesus. You say, I don't understand all this. It's okay. We're going to stand in a couple moments. The music's going to play. You just come straight ahead as soon as the music's playing. Talk to one of these men, and they'll help you know how you can be saved. But I preach primarily to those of us who are saved. Oh, that still sins keep coming back because we haven't dealt with the primary cause and that's self. That's self. And if you don't deal with it, it's going to get worse and it's going to lead to terrible consequences. The treatment, acknowledge your sin, yield your will, die to self and allow Christ to live in you. What are you going to do? What will you do about the root of all of your sin? I hope you'll come and surrender your will to God this morning. Father, I just pray that you'll work in our invitation. I pray you'll help each one to examine themselves. Lord, this will really change our lives. If we'll daily yield to you, we will prevent a lot of problems in our lives. Help us take a good prophylactic of yielding and submitting to you and dying to self and wanting your will. Please, Lord, let your will be done, we ask in Jesus' name.